Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Our guest was the director of the staggeringly beautiful movie, Billy Elliot. Now he's reconceived the work as a stage musical, which is equally wonderful, but amazingly different from the source film. And we are very happy tonight to be joined by Stephen Daldry. Stephen, welcome to your first appearance on Theater Talk. Thanks, nice to be here. And congratulations on the success of Billy Elliot, which, as you know, I saw in London uh, four years ago, and I just think it's one of the one of the best uh, contemporary musicals I've ever seen. And uh, much credit to you for putting that together. Oh well, thank you. Take us back, though, to um, the beginning of Billy Elliot, the movie, the whole idea. Lee Hall wrote the screenplay. Uh, Lee Hall's idea for it, did he come to you with the idea of this story about uh, uh, a boy in a mining town that's dying who wants to become a ballet dancer? Lee Hall's uh, one of my oldest friends and I've, I've known him almost all my adult life and we worked together in the Crucible Theatre, which is a regional theatre in England. And so we'd been keeping in touch and I knew he was starting to write a screenplay and sort of, and so he, he, we started talking about it and he was sort of quite, I don't know, sort of somewhat through the process and sent it to me and said, what do you think? Do you think this might work? And I, and at that point I hadn't made a film. So right, what, that's Billy Hall, Billy Elliot was your first movie. Yeah, what did I know? So I went, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, it could be. <laughs> um, and then he carried on, finished it, and then I sort of um, partly, I suppose it always appealed to me, and, and, it, and the miners' strike where the, the context of this story was something I'd been heavily involved in uh, myself um, uh, in the time in the sort of 84 to 85 in this big sort of turning point in post-war British domestic history. Just to give some context, this is when Margaret Thatcher clashed with a very powerful miners' union and essentially broke that union in the 1980s. It was a crucial moment for Margaret Thatcher because it was really breaking the most powerful union in the country and it's, she'd sort of set out to do this to, as a sort of starting point. If she could break the NUM, then she could break and the And how did unions. she break them? It would basically be England turned as close as you could have got for about 400 years into a civil war. Mm -hmm. and the country was really beginning to tear itself apart over the miners union and there was it was the deployment of soldiers was like weeks away and it was a very it was an extraordinary moment and what in, did the miners want the miners wanted to keep their pits open simple as that and margaret thatcher wanted to get rid of all the pits because if you get rid of the pits you get rid of the union right and and but if then what would have what was going to replace the pits nothing coal from colombia coal from poland ah. it didn't matter you just import sounds the coal. very familiar yeah the point was to break to break the union now how were you involved in this i was at university at the time and my first job actually i just finished university my first job um again i was at sheffield which is um the heart of South Yorkshire, which is a coal mining area. Right. My first job was working in a pit village called Barnborough, and my first professional job was directing a play during the miners' strike um, of women who were in the, the women's support groups. And uh, we did a play called Never the Same Again, mm. which was about what had happened to the women during, or what was happening to the women during the strike. And we taught it to all the different miners' welfare, this is their village halls, as a warm up act to Arthur Scargill, who was the president of the NUM. So, so what was happening then? to them because this is the context of what's happening to Billy Elliot's family. What was happening to people? Well, the women in particular yeah. in that context, although it's not quite the same for Billy Elliot because he yeah. didn't have a mum, but the women, the amount of support and the, the sort of extraordinary nature of how these communities started defending themselves against these attacks from the government was phenomenal. I mean, I mean in terms of feeding each other, finding support groups, creating support networks, bringing those villages together and those small towns together so they could survive and what was a year without any money, without any food, without any electricity, without, and all, obviously everything that could be repossessed being taken away from them. So the, this incredible community spirit came together and extraordinary plays and poems and songs and art. And, and Billy Elliot. And indeed, Billy Elliot. And so when Lee sent me the script, of course, <laughs> I went, oh, well, this is my subject. The Minor Strike is something I still feel. And I've made a couple of pieces of work about it um, in subsequent years from the Crucible years. And so it seemed a natural progression. And of course for Lee, who was a 
working class boy from Newcastle, right, right. which is the main town in sort of the northeast of England. Coles to Newcastle. Coles to Newcastle. He had, it was really his story, except he, had a, he was a writer, Instead working class boy, dancer, yeah. and he'd abstract it into dance. And I think, yes, and so he decided to write this little story. We didn't, but when we started the film, we were very, you know, it was a little, you know, baby film, you know, and I don't think any of us in the making of it really thought anybody would want to go and see it. Because it became one of the most popular independent movies ever made. I mean, it grossed, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars and has been seen all over, all over the world. Yeah, we were very surprised that it... We, you I mean, thought you were making just a, a little film for England? Well, or even for ourselves, hmm. to be frank. I mean, it, the, we first premiered the film at Cannes, which is where Elton John came to see it, by right. chance. Who's written the uh, music to Billy the music for the... And we, it was the first public showing, and... Uh, and we put it, you know, literally nobody had seen it, you know, we'd never put it in front of an audience. And, so, and I was there with Jamie Bell, who was, you know, taking Jamie with me and Julie Walters. The original Billy Elliot. The original Billy Elliot. And, and Julie Walters, it. who's so wonderful. So she, she got, was, uh, yeah, she's Oscar great. nomination. But we was just, it was amazing to watch, because we were like, oh my goodness, what, they're finding it funny, you know, our silly dumbass jokes. And <laughs> it was just a very odd experience watching an audience sort of rush towards the sort of material. But the other thing about the Billy Elliot is that, it's a movie. Now, it's, it's 19, uh, 2000, you made it, right? That's right. Yeah. So it's a clarion call for anyone who's an oddball, who's trying to, to, to follow their vision. And also, it seems very much sort of a gay liberation film in the sense that you, you don't define, <laughs> yeah, you don't define <laughs> Billy as necessarily being, being gay, but the idea that anybody who's queer in this community and, and has a different way he wants to be and is cleaving to the arts, to, to find to find recognition and affirmation affirmation by his community was an extraordinary thing. Did, did you think of the film in that way? That this is this is a movie about you know establishing a place for for well, I'll say queer people or gay people or people of the, of an aesthetic sensibility in these in this working class community. Just we because didn't. now I've said a mouthful, right? <laughs> no, no, we didn't. I mean, in a sense, just because someone's a ballet dancer doesn't mean they're gay. <laughs> No, we know I don't we... need to defend what I just said, <laughs> and anybody who's seen the movie knows I don't. That's why I ask you that again. I think that, in a sense, you know, that um, what's always interesting in any community is, I mean, you know, it freaks people who are different, you know, pe and I don't mean freaks in, in pejoratively at all, I just mean people who are different and want to, it's exactly what you said, want to, to achieve something else. And you portray else. a great deal of homophobia in the community, you have it in the film and you have it even more in, 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 the, in the stage version where there's a, there's a great deal, uh, you, I mean, you, you added that scene with the father with the ballet dancer where there is a fear of this, not to cut you off. That, well, the yeah. masculinity is a key yes, issue yes, about what yes. is the nature of masculinity mm -hmm. and, and ballet being you know, a, a version of masculinity, but one that actually can be quite terrifying for certain people. So I, in, the, in terms of it being gay, no, but in terms of masculinity, yes. And obviously the boy challenges his father's masculinity by actually having this idea of grace and what is grace. One of the great things about this idea of grace, which I'm very keen on, is that actually people really recognise it. One of the things that we were really wanted to build into the show was that the father, whilst not understanding ballet, and it wouldn't right. really understand whether the kid was good or not, understood the idea of grace. Define that term, though, by grace. What do you mean, the, the grace? It's a complicated term to define, and, and I, I, I quite like it in its ambiguity. But what I mean by grace, I suppose, is, is the idea of, of beauty. Mm -hmm. But beauty, in a sense, through in this context, through movement. Mm -hmm. And I do think people, um, audiences, as well as Billy's dad, understand this without actually necessarily having the means to analyse why that should be so. I also wonder, though, if the father didn't come around to accepting the boy. That you, you have a scene where you have a, the character of his older brother, who, at some point in your plot, in both the film and, and the thing, shows such brutality and prejudice that it's almost like the father turns and, and, and thinks, well, I don't want my younger son to be this way. To be different. It, yes, to be so so brutal. Those mining communities, the real mining communities, obviously did fight very hard to maintain their communities, and after the pits were shut by Guess what's happened to them? They were, they, they were, you know, the mines were all shut, and there's no mines left in England now. Um, all those people did get, un were on unemployment and those communities have entirely collapsed. So Easington, which is where our story is set, um, which was a very vibrant, strong, crime-free, you know, well-educated, working-class community, is now one of the black holes of European poverty yeah. mm. and with some of the highest heroin addiction levels in Europe. 
Mm. And so they, they, you know, what the Margaret Thatcher did do is literally destroy not just the the union, but actually then destroy those communities. Well, and I think Americans are going to relate to this in a certain way because now this is what's happened to our country, although ten years later, in the sense of the of the, the industrial heart of the country being destroyed. Tim. We are all moving into a post-industrial phase, yes, yes. And, and and the and how that is managed, um, obviously. Can, is, is crucial. In England, it was managed incredibly badly with incredible, awful human cost. To me, I thought what's so, what's so moving about the movie and, and the musical as well is that when you have this boy who's doing something, what shall we say, out of the ordinary for this community, the community eventually comes around to see that it's finished. This is a community that has been destroyed. But it will live on through this boy who will go into a whole other world and take that spirit of that community with him elsewhere. I mean, is that... Uh, that what... yeah, that's exactly the intention. I mean, and I... <laughs> it breaks my heart. I mean, I just love it because it's so... This little child who's doing this weird thing called ballet and then suddenly all the hopes and dreams of that community invested in this little phoenix that's going to leave. And, and the, that's why, for me, the farewells are so important because everybody's giving this child this future, giving them their hopes, and, and then he's off on, on his own way. And, and what happens to the people left behind? Who knows, but it doesn't feel good. Yeah. What, what was the decision to turn it into a musical? It was no decision, really. It happened because Elton wanted to do it. <laughs> and Elton really said, you know... If Elton the... wants to do it, you're going to do it. Well, and, well, no, well, I think Lee and I were going, you know, after Elton said, you should, you know, and David Furnish's partner said, well, why don't you do it on stage? We went, well, I never even thought about that. And it took a couple of years, and Lee started writing some lyrics with Elton, and then we did a little workshop at the Old Vic, actually, on stage at the Old Vic. Mm. And we started, and then it was only really after that workshop we thought, well, maybe we should give this a go, but we need to, you know, focus it slightly differently, like focus on the community. Mm -hmm. um, but it, out of the workshop, it, it, certain things became clear that, oh, right, the dancing, you know, could be, you know, where a lot of songs normally wouldn't be in musicals. Maybe the dance could be like the songs. That mm -hmm. could be cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, behavioural movement that's unconscious within the adults could be made into certain dance sort of pieces, mm -hmm. but they're not knowing necessarily they're dancing. It's taking different natural behavioural patterns and turning them into movement, into dance. Mm -hmm. And just, oh, oh if it's all in the hall, then the hall, and there is a sort of time and place sort of logic to it. There's not a million different locations and maybe it could work. Yeah, I said at the beginning I was surprised <coughs> at how different it was from the movie and that's because you didn't get hung up on your own your own scenario. You really re-envisioned every well, idea in a way that some people who come and look at somebody else's movie get stuck on that movie and, and, and don't change it for the stage in the way that it must be. Yeah, we have no respect for the movie, so that's really that's, good. You're not, <laughs> you're, exactly. you're, right, you're not hung right up on anything. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was in London during your preview period, which was very extensive, and the show was very long originally. And is it true that you had people like uh, the movie producer Scott Rudin, who produced The Hours that, that you directed, the fine movie, and Steve Sondheim, Tom Schumacher from Disney, everybody loved this piece, and they were all coming in in the previews to sort of, you know, check it out and give and notes. Help me. And and yeah, help you. <laughs> and help me. Scott was fantastic. He flew in every week and gave, watched a show, flew back again, gave me notes. And Steve Sondheim went a few times, I yeah. think. Did he give you any pointers or any tips? He he was fantastic about, you know, what, what should... <laughs> I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but it's like, what should be in the first half? What should be in the second half? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, yeah, just things like that. And actually, you know, the second half in London was always a little bit trying to solve certain things in the second half. And I do think our second half is the best we've come up with so far. Mm. I feel much happier now. Now, I also remember, um, uh, I've talked to Elton about this, because I find Elton <coughs> John's um, approach to writing musicals very interesting, since he's often writing them when he's not anywhere near them. And was it you who told me that um, you'd sort of have a cell phone during the previews and hold up and say, Elton, we need a song that's going to go here, and hold the cell phone up so we can hear the scene? Is that, that how it works? It certainly didn't work like that, no. <laughs> um, but Elton, was, Elton has been a fantastic collaborator all the way through. Uh -huh. And really, what was great about, again, his relationship with Lee is that they've, they, they tapped into a whole variety of different uh, traditions that we were working with. Because we, we really wanted to embrace what, again, what... I don't mean to be particular about this, but there, there's an English director called Joan Littlewood who, mm -hmm, sure. who at, at a theatre called Stratford East, really managed to make a working class uh, theatre language using a whole variety of different um, elements of working class tradition, which include folk dancing, anthems, rock and roll. Do you know what I mean? The, 
variety. Oh, what a lovely war! Yeah. And that, oh, and make, in particular, making it into a, a lovely war among, amongst other pieces. And so we wanted to try to find a a real clash of different working class cultures that could really hit up against each other. And that's what's great about Elton's score is that it's he really does find, oh, let's have the great anthem as the men go back to work. Oh, let's have the silly rock and roll number. Let's have the Christmas sort of like Slade number for Maggie Thatcher. And finding the very particular nature of all the different um, language of the show. How do you work with someone like Elton, who's a worldwide superstar, who in the old days of doing a musical, you'd go out of town for four or five weeks, and the composer would be living, you know, right there in the hotel room, and the director or the producer would be, you know, beating with a spit and with a stick to get that tune out. How do you work with someone who is touring and traveling and in Vegas and who's not there on the spot when you're putting together such such a, a, a an ambitious show? Well, there's a couple of things really. First of all. Um, when we were doing the workshop, he was around. Mm -hmm. So he and he, we did start experimenting with different things. We had a few other songs in there. David Furnish's partner is always with us, mm. and so there's a very close communication about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and how the orchestrations and the arrangements, which are crucial, how those are developing, which do always get involved. We always get Elton involved in all of uh, all of the arrangements because they're sometimes radically different to the original intent, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I go to Vegas. <laughs> 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 and sit without me. How nice is that? Now, now, I ran into you the other night, and you said something I was I thought, thought was very touching. You, you've spent a lot of time shaping the performances of many uh, young boys who are playing Billy Elliot. I don't, I don't know how many. How many have you had? Fifteen. Fifteen in England. So this we're up to our fifteen, sixteen, seventy, eighteen, eighteen now. And the four in Australia. 18. 22. 22 kids, many of whom have had no stage experience before, who are not trained actors or singers, maybe ballet dancers. But you had just seen one of the Billies do something that night that you thought he's, he's had this breakthrough. And I remember you said to me, no one else will pick up on it, but I do. Do you think really, you, you become that involved with shaping these kids' performances? And it's, there's, there's, there's an amazing, one of the reasons why I keep loving doing the show is there is a, an amazing conflation between what the journey of, of Billy and the, the story, you know, there's this little kid who sort of stumbles across a dance and school and ends up going through a ballet school. And then in terms of our audition process and where we find the kids, we find these kids who are often have certain skills, but none of the kids come with all the required skills. And so you have, they have to go through a training program. And often the kids have never performed, except maybe dance, but usually never performed, acted or sung or and often with ballet, it's quite a restraining form. I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean that it's classical in that it's classical there are, there are... and it's tight and it's yeah. to release the child when the kid gets to a point where they're starting to really find their journey through the show, and you get these moments of breakthrough when the child suddenly goes, "I know how to." They can start. Feeling it, and we push the kids are pushed to the limit of what's possible for them to do. And part of the joy of the show is seeing a child who literally, possibly, shouldn't, can't even do it, so that you feel the struggle of the child through the struggle of the show, which is the struggle of the character. Mm -hmm. But when you get these moments when the child just suddenly bashes through, or comes through, comes alive, suddenly just finds a new level to go to, oh. it's one of the most amazing things you can. And it's palpable. I mean, I don't think it's just personal to me. I think the audience suddenly go, oh my God, that kid. Because the kid's discovering it as he's doing it. And it's one of the most exciting things you can ever see. Well, what was the quality then that made you choose that child that you knew that you was going to know. come? You uh, on the whole, you don't know. You have to, when you're casting the kids, you, you know, that this is good. I mean, just out of interest, that this is what they need to have on a, right, a skill yes. base. <laughs> they need to have enough ballet to, um, to plausibly get into the Royal Ballet School. Usually that means they've got four years of ballet at least minimum before they come to us. Uh -huh. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes you've got to teach the child ballet, but usually they come with ballet. Tap they often don't have, so then you've got, they've got to spend years often, you know, I mean I literally mean years, learning how to work tap, which often is diametrically opposed in technique to ballet. Mm. Then they've got to learn contemporary dance and what that means to, as I say, to express themselves through movement rather than technique. Then they've got to learn how to sing, as often they'd never have sung before. Then they've got to learn how to project and uh, do basic actions. Then they've got to do the whole thing within a 
particular accent and dialect from the northeast of England. So it's it's plus gymnastics they've got to do, and they've got to be flying, and you know all these other. They have charisma to carry a twenty million dollar show on their. Backs. And then on the top of that, you're looking for a kid who you know who in the end might just have that thing that goes, yeah, it's. I'm happy, have it. I'm happy to be in front of 1,500 people and I can hold them. <laughs> but it's, it's do you have a training group and then do you pick the best ones out of the training You've group? You've got a Billy Elliott school, We've, don't you? It's somewhere yeah, we're slightly different systems in different countries, but in uh, the most extreme one being in England, where we actually have a school in the north of England. Wow. So you audition for the school, not for the show. Mm. And basically what we do in America is the same thing. The, when you audition children, you're not really auditioning for the show, you're auditioning for what is an incredibly intensive and incredibly expensive one-to-one -one training program which can be anything up to a year or 18 months and from that training program you then actually cast the kids. Do you have these moments though because these kids grow up, they grow up while they're doing the show and it's time for them to leave. I mean do you have to like take a kid who's had a great run being Billy Elliot for a couple of years and take him aside and say your you know, voice you, has changed, you're too old, you so long, good I luck. Know. It's, it is, usually the kids know. Really? And usually the kids will tell you when they're going to mm. go. They can. They always feel their body changing and the voice going. Mm. And they us, you're usually in conversation about it anyway. The kids leaving the show is devastatingly heartbreaking. Mm. I mean, there's no. It, it always devastates me. Mm. And it's partly because of you often spent now years with these kids. You take them out of their homes. You've educated them. You've been with them, and the cast has been with them, and the, there's a new family has formed for them. So leaving it is is. Um, it's heartbreaking, which is why we, and we do have after show care, which is why we have a social worker who helps them do all that. <laughs> well, once survive. they go outside the stage door and the yeah, kingdom is gone, they go to the social worker. <laughs> well, you need a kid social worker so that, you know, yeah, they yeah. can find a way like back to school. Like ex-child stars, that's yeah. pretty great. Yeah. Uh, all right, Stephen, we got to wrap it up. It's great talking to you. But I want to say that um, when you are not doing Billy Elliot, which takes a great deal of your time, you've got a new movie that you're just finishing, The Reader, based on the fine German novel by... Bernard Schlink. Bernard Schlink, right, about... Um, well, I don't want to give it away, but a woman who uh, worked in a concentration camp at one point in her it's, life. Yeah, it's, it, it is a, it, it's, a, it's a film about um, post-war German guilt, essentially. Yeah. It's, it's a love story. But, With uh, a screenplay by David Hare. By David Hare, that's uh, it. All right. Uh, Stephen Daldry, the director of Billy Elliot at the Imperial Theatre. It's a terrific new musical. Don't miss it. And thanks for being our guest on Adam Theatre Talk. It's been a pleasure. Always good talking to you. Good Very to nice you. to see you both. This week we're going to begin a new segment in search of the outrageous with our new theater core editor and associate producer Aaron Riccio who's going to tell us about some of the theater you might not otherwise hear about that's not on Broadway. Uh, yes, we've sent Aaron out throughout the city trying to find all these uh, offbeat, wild and crazy little plays that are going on out there that um, those of us who cover Broadway sometimes don't have the, the time to get to. Uh, and Aaron has been foraging around town lately. And what have you picked up? Yeah, Aaron? and actually he's going to talk about something that's fairly well known. Uh, the play that I've chosen is Blasted by Sarah Kane. Uh, it's being done at Soho Rep right now. And the play itself is a play about human relationships becoming totally shattered and ripped apart to the point where truth is the only thing that's left visible um, and the open bleeding scars on these people bring about a truth and a, a real human emotion that is rarely seen on the stage. The buzz around town is that this is a very violent play. Well, it gets progressively violent, but the, what's so good about the play and this direction of it is that it stays rooted in realism first and foremost before it gets to some of the bleaker and harder to depict on stage moments. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to give anything away, but I'm sure people have heard. Just give us a little taste. Well, um, there's a taste that's involved in the play. Um, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's just say there's some eating of flesh and pounding of flesh. And is there is this there cannibalism in this play? Um, well, of a corpse. Hmm. Uh, I don't want to go on too much more. And yet, than you that. say that ultimately this play about what yeah. de degrading, horrible, debasing things people do to each other, including apparently eating them, it ends on a hopeful note. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of. Uh, it's a very Beckett-type Beckett play towards the end. It starts to get more and more surreal as it goes on. And the reason why this production works and the reason why I say that everybody should go out and see it is because it takes that surrealism, but it keeps it grounded in reality. Mm. Now, Sarah Kane um, yeah. committed suicide. She did. All these plays have been uh, produced pos posthumously. Well, no, this was produced while she was, while she was still alive. alive. And do you know that Stephen Daltrey uh, originally commissioned Bash for the Royal Court? 
But do yeah. we know uh, why she killed herself? Did she leave a note? Um, do we have a sense of who she was? Was she, is, no. she apparently she was quite depressed. There's a lot of depression involved. There, there's yeah. depression, yeah. Now we know this play is very violent. Yeah. Should people stay away if they're squeamish? No. I would say if people are squeamish, they should tear down the walls just like the play tears down its own walls and really buck up and open their eyes. Okay. I think sometimes it's good to have a little medicine for the soul. Okay, so blast it. It's at the Soho Rep. It's yep. extended now? It's extended twice, yeah. Okay. So it'll be playing through December. All right. Keep looking for new stuff, Aaron. Yeah. All, all right. right.